Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India morning ladies and gentlemen my name is amlesh seth i am a professor of urology at all india institute of medical sciences today i am going to talk to you about renal tumors when we say renal tumors we basically mean renal parenchymal tumors although in the kidney from the pelvic elicel system a number of tumors can arise the commonest tumor from the pelvic elicel system is a urothelial carcinoma Sometimes in patients who have chronic irritation due to stone disease, there may be a squamous cell carcinoma in the uh, pelvic elicel system. Very rarely an adenocarcinoma may also exist. But I am not going to talk about the pelvic elicel tumors and I am going to talk about renal parenchymal tumors. The list of the various types of renal parenchymal tumors is long. I have just chosen a few of the benign and malignant renal tumors which are relatively common and as you can see from the list the benign ones are adenoma oncocytoma angiomyolipoma leiomyoma hemangioma lipoma and jg cell tumors and the malignant ones are renal cell carcinoma wilms renal sarcoma and secondaries the important thing is that malignant tumors are significantly more common than benign tumors more than 90% of the tumors are malignant tumors so much so that based on imaging only that if there is a solid tumor it is presumed that it is a malignant renal tumor <clears throat> i shall be briefly talking about the benign ones and then i shall be talking about the malignant ones in detail the term of renal adenoma has been used variably and as per who the term renal adenoma should be dropped now uh, leiomyomas hemangiomas lipomas and jg cell tumors are very rare and i shall not be talking about them the renal oncocytoma is important not because it is very common but amongst the benign ones it is relatively common and it can have a totally benign clinical behavior to a low grade malignancy also the oncocytoma as you would have read in your pathology classes uh, they have certain common features and they can occur in the salivary glands thyroid parathyroid and in the adrenal area 3% of all renal tumors are oncocytomas on gross pathology there is a typical appearance that is described which is known as a spoke wheel appearance which can sometimes be appreciated on ct scan but this is not very specific and since in renal tumors uh, the main clinical decisions are based on imaging and one may not be very certain based on imaging whether it's a renal oncocytoma or a malignant renal tumor most of these get treated like a malignant renal tumor uh, the preoperative imaging or fine needle aspiration cytology cannot differentiate this from renal cell carcinoma and therefore as i have already mentioned these tumors get treated like renal cell carcinoma renal hamartoma is also known as a renal angiomyolipoma this is a benign tumor and there are three components the mature fat smooth muscles and blood vessels that is why it is called angiomyolipoma and there is a very common association between tuberous sclerosis and angiomyolipoma the patients who have typical features of tuberous sclerosis have a very high incidence of angiomyolipoma and therefore there are two types the sporadic variety and the other variety which is associated with tuberous sclerosis on ultrasonogram fat is highly echogenic and if there is a highly echogenic tumor on ultrasonogram 
then you can strongly suspect that to be uh, an angiomyelipoma. On CT scan also there may be a good amount of fat that may be seen which would give Hounsfield values of minus 20 to minus 80 and you would be certain that you are dealing with a case of angiomyelipoma. The important thing is that this is one renal benign tumor which can be diagnosed more or less categorically on imaging and therefore it has to be treated as a benign tumor. But there are some patients who have a renal angiomyelipoma which may be fat poor which is known as lipopenic angiomyelipoma and lipopenic angiomyelipoma may not be very certainly diagnosed either on ultrasonogram or on CT scan and sometimes in a situation where it may be borderline an MRI is required with some special sequences. Uh, I shall be talking about these special sequences uh, very soon. The uh, talking about the clinical features of angiomyelipoma, when the angiomyelipomas are small, they are asymptomatic. The problem is that sometimes they can lead to retroperitoneal bleeding and sometimes this bleeding can be severe. But it has been noticed that in renal angiomyelipomas that are small, the incidence of spontaneous retroperitoneal bleeding is low. And therefore, if the lesion is less than 4 centimeters, the guideline is that these lesions can be observed. And if the lesions are more than 4 centimeters, then they should be treated. And all symptomatic angiomyelipomas, whether they are giving rise to pain or they have bled, irrespective of the size, should be treated. What is the treatment for angiomyelipoma? The angiomyelipoma is a benign lesion and therefore a limited resection or a partial nephrectomy of the lesion should be done or uh, <clears throat> the other modality is a highly selective angioembolization wherein the radiologist specifically positions the catheter inside the branch of the renal artery that is specifically supplying that renal angiomyelipoma and then that branch is embolized and blocked with some embolus. If the entire kidney is completely removed by replaced by angiomyelipoma, then radical nephrectomy is the only answer. <coughs> this is a patient, here you can see on the right side there is a black rounded lesion which is having the Hounsfield values of fat. And one is more or less certain that this is an angiomyelipoma. And since this is small and since this patient was asymptomatic, this patient was kept on observation. <coughs> this is an angiomyelipoma which is not very typical. There are certain areas which are looking like fat, but there are other areas which are looking like solid uh, lesions. And on CT scan, although there is a suspicion but one needs to be more certain and these special sequences of MRI have been carried out. This is a T2 weighted image, this is a fat uh, sat image and this is a fat suppressed image and combining all these images we are certain that this is an angiomyelipoma and then this patient can be treated like an angiomyelipoma. <coughs> Coming to renal cell carcinoma, as I have mentioned that almost 85 to 90 percent of all solid renal tumors, solid when I say solid on imaging are renal cell carcinomas. So therefore all solid tumors unless there are features to suggest either an abscess, an organized abscess or a lymphoma or other uh, features to suggest some other disease, they all have to be presumed to be malignant renal tumors and they have to be treated like, like a malignant renal tumor. 3% uh, of all cancers in adults are renal cell uh, tumors and um, as mentioned about 85 to 90% of all renal tumors are malignant renal cell carcinomas. The commonest age of presentation is in the 5th or 6th decade of life. Although there may be some small children and some elderly patients also 
having renal cell carcinomas. The tumors are more common in males compared to females. The etiology is mainly unknown, although in some epidemiologic studies, smokers have a higher incidence of renal cell carcinoma. Patients who have had ex exposure to asbestos, they have a higher incidence of renal cell carcinoma. Obese people are more prone to develop, but these are not very strong associations. The, there are a few genetic, uh, uh, genetic uh, situations where there is a high incidence of uh, renal cell carcinoma. There are certain families where the, the, uh, the, these tumors run and one of them is BHD syndrome which is being studied. The von Hippel Lindau disease has been known for many, many decades and these patients have an autosomal dominant disease and they have almost a 100% incidence of either unilateral or bilateral or multiple uh, renal, clear cell renal cell carcinomas or cystic renal cell carcinomas and there are certain families of hereditary papillary renal cell carcinomas that have been described. In the pathology, there are four common types and there are a few uncommon types. The important thing is that recently, for the last few years or so, we have started understanding the molecular bases and there are molecular markers that can distinguish between various types and in future, there may be uh, specific treatments that may be available for uh, different varieties. But for the time being, most of these tumors are treated in the same way and the mainstay of treatment of all of these at the present time is surgery. The Robson's staging has been in vogue for many decades and although the present uh, the system that is used more commonly is the TNM staging, but there are certain common features. And for the sake of deciding the treatment, the Robson staging is reasonably good and uh, one can use either of the two systems and uh, the, the guidelines would be more or less the same. If it is within the kidney, it is stage 1. If it is within the gerota's fascia, including the adrenal, it is stage 2. If there is a renal vein or IVC tumor thrombus. I would like to emphasize here that almost 3 to 5 percent of renal cell carcinomas are associated with a tumor thrombus that progresses into the renal vein and slowly can even go up till the right atrium or even beyond without having metastasis either in the lymph nodes or systemic metastasis. And these patients have a better prognosis and therefore this is uh, kept in the category of stage 3a and if regional lymph nodes are involved then although it seems that it is an earlier disease compared to the renal vein thrombus but these patients have a poorer prognosis and therefore they have been classified in stage 3b and if both lymph nodes as well as renal vein thrombus are present then it is stage 3c if adjacent organs are involved which means that it is an advanced disease then it is classified as stage 4a adjacent organs may be in the form of tail of pancreas or splenic hilum on the left side and colon can be involved either on the right or the left side and duodenum is sometimes involved on the right side uh, there may be an involvement of the psoas or uh, the posterior abdominal wall or the anterior abdominal wall and that would also be classified as a stage 4a disease. If there are systemic metastasis, then it is classified as a stage 4b disease. Coming to the clinical symptoms, at the present time, almost 50 percent of these patients are being diagnosed in the asymptomatic stage. When an ultrasonogram or other some imaging, abdominal imaging is done for either as a part of routine screening or as, uh, as a part of investigation of some other illness and simultaneously these lesions are detected. I would like to emphasize here that routine screening 
by ultrasonogram for renal cell carcinoma is not recommended, but sometimes ultrasonogram is done for some other lesions and these tumors are picked up. The classic triad which has been described in the textbooks is a combination of lump, flank pain and hematuria and either of these three symptoms may be present individually or in a combination and if all three are present in the form of this triad then the chances of having a renal cell carcinoma are very very high. But unfortunately if the triad is present a number of these patients have too advanced a disease and may not be in a state of cure. The renal cell carcinoma is also known as an internist tumor because, in, because uh, the association of fever with renal cell carcinoma is quite high and the number of these patients would present to the internal medicine specialist or the internist with fever and on investigations for pyrexia of unknown origin, they would be detected to have a renal cell carcinoma. If there are metastases, then depending upon the site of metastasis, the patients may present with uh, specific symptoms. The commonest metastases from renal cell carcinoma are into the lungs, into the lung fields and these patients may present with cough or dyspnea. Sometimes if there are extensive hepatic metastases, they may present with jaundice or loss of appetite. Bony pain would be a feature if there are bony metastases. And if there are CNS metastases, then the patients may present with altered sensorium. After the pulmonary, the bony and CNS metastases are, uh, uh, are common in incidence, but the commonest are the pulmonary metastases. Renal cell carcinoma has a very high incidence and a and a significant variety of paraneoplastic syndromes. The commonest paraneoplastic syndrome is anemia, but anemia can occur in a number of illnesses, not specific for renal cell carcinoma. Erythrocytosis is, is erythrocytosis, hypercalcemia, hypertension and Stoffer syndrome are more specific paraneoplastic syndromes of renal cell carcinoma. Stoffer syndrome is what is known as asymptom, uh, uh, non-metastatic derangement of liver function tests. Normally, if liver function tests are deranged, then the likelihood of metastasis is high. But in patients with renal cell carcinoma, if the LFTs are deranged, then it should not be presumed that these patients have hepatic metastasis and after removal of the primary renal tumor by a radical nephrectomy, the derangement in the liver function tests can be, uh, would get reversed and if it gets reversed, this would be classified as Stoffer's syndrome or a non-metastatic derangement of liver function tests. In a patient who is suspected to have a renal cell carcinoma or a renal tumor, the investigations that are usually advised are a complete hemogram, a complete biochemistry including uh, blood sugar, liver function tests, renal function tests, a complete urine analysis and a chest x-ray should almost, uh, should always be done. If there are cannon balls that are seen on the chest x-ray, then that is a metastatic disease and as I mentioned earlier, the pulmonary metastases are the commonest. X-ray KUB may pick up a soft tissue shadow, there may be some calcific spots or the bony metastases into the, into the bones that are seen within the KUB area may show may evidence of some bony destruction in the uh, indicating a bony metastasis. Intravenous urogram has been the uh, classically described imaging investigation, but intravenous urogram is not a very sensitive investigation. The features that are mentioned on, infra, on intravenous urogram are Kelly cell cutoff, distortion of a calyx or a spider leg deformity or stretching of the calyx. But as I mentioned that these would be seen in patients who have a relatively 
big renal cell carcinoma and therefore IVU is not a very sensitive investigation for renal cell carcinoma. On ultrasonogram, if there is a solid lesion, then as I mentioned, the differential diagnosis would be relatively narrow and in a large percentage of patients, it would be a malignant renal tumor. Uh, uh, the CT scan, the contrast enhanced CT scan or the MDCT, the multi detector CT scan is considered the standard, the gold standard for diagnosis as well as for staging of renal cell carcinoma. A very precise staging of renal cell carcinoma can be carried out by CECT. MRI would provide a slightly better picture compared to CT scan for the venous thrombus, the upper extent is better seen by MRI, but a good quality CT scan can also show the extent reasonably well. As I have already mentioned, sometimes for a more certain diagnosis of angiomyelipoma, various types of MRI sequences may be required. Angiography used to be a very common investigation for renal cell carcinoma almost 20 years ago, but now it is for a very, very selective use only in patients where a road map of the renal vessels is required which cannot be provided by a CT or a CT angiogram is an angiogram uh, done. Sometimes in patients who have a solitary kidney with a complex anatomy or an ectopic kidney or a fused kidney, an angiography may be required for a partial nephrectomy. But as I am, uh, as I have mentioned, angiography has a very limited role. Angiography may sometimes be done in association with angioembolization, but the indications for angioembolization for renal cell carcinoma are also decreasing. As I have already mentioned again and again, that the mainstay of diagnosis at the present time is on imaging. What happens in the future, we don't know. But at the present time, the fine needle aspiration cytology, which is commonly used for so many malignancies, has a relatively limited role. In patients who are suspected to have an abscess or a lymphoma or a secondary in uh, where the primary is already known, a fine needle aspiration cytology may be carried out. Percutaneous image guided biopsy also has a limited role in patients who have big lesions. But there are some centers who are now advocating a percutaneous image guided biopsy for small renal biops for small renal lesions where there may be a diagnostic dilemma or where one may need to decide whether to keep the patient on conservative management or advise a partial nephrectomy or some other surgical intervention. In patients who have an early lesion, the standard of care at the present time is what is known as a nephron sparing surgery, which means removal of the tumor with a limited margin that can be either in the form of a polar resection or a wedge resection or a heminephrectomy. The main idea is that the tumor should be removed with as much of sparing of the uh, renal parenchyma as possible. And in patients who have either a perinephric involvement or a large tumor, a radical nephrectomy is the standard of care. In radical nephrectomy, all the contents of the gerota's fascia are removed, which means the kidney is removed with its coverings till the gerota's fascia. In patients who have an IVC thrombus, till whatever extent, these are classified as stage 3A disease. A radical surgery including the radical uh, removal of the kidney within the gerota's fascia and the IVC thrombectomy should be done. And the IVC thrombectomy even if it needs uh, a cardiopulmonary bypass, even if it needs that the patient should be put on 
a hypothermic circulatory arrest, the entire tumor thrombus should be removed. In patients who have limited lymph node disease, a radical surgery including removal of all the lymph nodes is advocated, but as mentioned earlier, the prognosis is poor, but a cure should be attempted. Adjuvant tyrosine kinase inhibitors are under study. In the absence of gross measurable disease, adjuvant tyrosine kinase inhibitors are, un, are do not have a, an established role and experimental protocols are there of use of adjuvant TKIs or other adjuvant therapies. In patients who have a stage 4a disease which means that the adjacent organs are invaded, a radical surgery is the mainstay of treatment at the present time and that may include removal of the distal part of the pancreas, a distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, hemicolectomy or excision of the uh, abdominal wall that is infiltrated. So, a radical surgery is what provides a reasonably, uh, reasonably good uh, form of treatment in stage 4a disease. Those who have a stage 4b disease which means that there are, metas there are uh, metastases, there are systemic metastases, then the treatment has to be individualized, then one has to see whether the patient is a candidate for uh, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors or an adjunctive radical nephrectomy or even metastasectomy. All these treatments have to be individualized depending upon the extent of metastasis, the performance status of the patient and what, what surgeries are possible. Whether it is technically feasible to remove the metastasis which may be single or uh, multiple, but if solitary metastasis is present and if it is technically possible, then the guideline is to do a radical nephrectomy and remove the solitary metastasis. This is a patient who has a huge renal cell carcinoma and here you can see the large renal tumor replacing the entire kidney and coming out of the kidney a huge football like mass, but easily removable by a radical nephrectomy. This is a patient who has more or less a complete replacement of the right kidney with a tumor which is highly necrotic. You can see multiple areas of necrosis, the tumor is coming out of the kidney, the border, borders are uh, uh, irregular and as can be seen this was not a very well encapsulated tumor, a more aggressive tumor. This turned out to be a sarcoma and if you do a radical nephrectomy, then uh, all the contents of the gerota's fascia should be removed and at the end of the surgery, if the lymph nodes also have to be removed, if there is limited lymph node disease or if patients have highly necrotic large tumors or the suspicion of sarcoma then all the lymph nodes should also be removed. In this picture you can see all the lymph nodes in front of the IVC, aorta, inter aorta cable, all these lymph nodes have, also, have all been removed. But I would like to mention here that when we use the term radical nephrectomy, then radical nephrectomy does not include removal of the lymph nodes. Radical nephrectomy basically includes removal of the kidney within the gerota's fascia and this degree of extensive lymph node removal is not a part of radical nephrectomy. This is a patient with a relatively well defined renal cyst. I just included this CT scan to provide you an idea that there may be sometimes relatively benign uh, diseases also. And although cystic disease is discussed under a separate heading, but on ultrasonogram one can very easily confirm that this is a clear fluid filled cyst and no treatment is required. This is a patient who has a huge cyst. These cysts are uncommon, but sometimes there can be really big 
benign cysts that do not need any treatment. As I have already mentioned, an IVC thrombus is seen in 3 to 5 percent of these patients. This is a patient who has a thrombus which is tumor thrombus which is coming out of the renal vein and going into the IVC and on the right side of the screen you can see there is a big renal tumor and in the center you can see the renal vein and IVC junction that has been opened and the tumor thrombus extracted and this is a removal this is a radical nephrectomy with IVC thrombectomy. This is another patient who has had a radical nephrectomy with IVC thrombectomy. Here in the radical nephrectomy specimen you can see that Gerota's fascia is covering the entire tumor and that is what is the definition of a radical nephrectomy, not the lymph node clearance. Uh, as I mentioned that partial nephrectomy or nephron sparing surgery is being carried out more and more commonly for small renal tumors which may be occupying either a pole or the interpolar area. And for that sometimes you may need to uh, dissect out the branches of the renal artery, but that may neither be possible nor easy in most situations. And sometimes you may be able to carry out a partial nephrectomy by putting these hemostatic stitches, but more commonly it is the tumor extent that decides the amount of kidney to be removed and this is a patient who is having removal of almost 40 percent of the kidney and uh, uh, so one decides based on the extent of the disease and after the kidney is removed then the hemostasis is carried out and uh, the partial nephrectomy is is uh, is carried out under clamping of either the renal artery or both the renal artery and the vein and after the partial nephrectomy is carried out hemostasis the vessels have to be carefully ligated all the arterial branches have to be carefully ligated and hemostasis completed and then the kidney has to be repaired what is known as a reno raffi this is a patient who has a metastatic disease. This is a patient who has a metastatic disease. On the left side, you can see a large tumor and in the liver there are multiple space occupying lesions. And this is another patient with a metastasis in the chest wall. Another patient with a chest wall metastasis, but as I have mentioned, the more common metastasis are multiple pulmonary metastasis and in the presence of metastatic disease, traditionally immunotherapy has been used. Pa radiotherapy is used mainly for palliation of bony pain. Here I would like to mention chemotherapy has a very limited role. Renal Tumors have what is known as an MDR gene or a multi drug resistance gene. A number of these chemotherapeutic agents are extruded by the renal tumor cells, and the response to chemotherapy is very poor. And this is one tumor which is always mentioned as a tumor having very poor response to chemotherapy. The Present day treatment of metastatic disease is mainly in the form of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are used as the first line drugs in most situations. The first tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which was approved in 2003, was sunitinib, and subsequently, a number of tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been uh, approved. Sorafenib, pezopenib, and exitinib are in common use and a few more are under the stage of development. The other group of drugs which are used for metastatic disease are mTOR inhibitors or inhibitors of mammalian target of rapamycin and temsorolimus, evrolimus have been in use for some time and these are generally used as second line drugs and at the present time we are trying to understand what combinations and in what sequences 
uh, should these drugs be used. Thank you very much.